Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll get started. Thank you again all for being here on such a beautiful, really first full spring day we've had. So I so, so appreciate the sea of people that I see in front of me. I'm really, really grateful. Um, there are some thank yous that I'd like to make right off the bat. I would love to thank Holleran Center for helping us sponsor this event, the Opus College of Business, and then of course the School of Law. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is our inaugural online LLM students are here. Um, they have flown from Illinois, Georgia, and Texas to be at this event today, and they're all sitting in the front here. So let's give them a warm welcome. Some of them are from Minneapolis, a couple of them are, but um, many of them have never stepped foot into the St. Thomas building, so it's wonderful to have them here. So, you know, as I think about why I have these events or why we have these events, one of the primary reasons is really as a way to showcase the incredible female talent we have in the compliance and ethics space. I think that it's important to do and, and at a time, you know, right now with the hashtag Me Too and kind of just all that's going on, I think it's just that much more important. But the other, uh, and I would say the primary reason, is really to generate buzz about the profession. The compliance and ethics pressure, uh, profession is exceptional, I think. Um, it's, it's one of the it's one of the industries that really does make a difference, and these women really ex exemplify that. But the, the students in the room, the um, beginning level to mid-level to senior level career professional that, that's in the audience, you guys are our future. So it's really important that, that you be get engaged and that we stay engaged as an educational institution. That's one of the reasons why I put the survey together, and I think Jenna probably handed out surveys on all the tables, and if you could, please fill those out and give them to Jenna when you leave, or just simply turn them over and leave them on the table. But it really does help me, and I really, really do listen to you as compliance and prof uh, ethics professionals. Y you matter a whole lot to me. So with that, I would like to now go to the women of the hours. They are amazing, as I'm sure all of you know. Um, I'm going to start with Lisa Crossley. Lisa, if you could just, oh, you're at the end there. Ms. Crossley is the Executive Director and Corporate Secretary for the National Society of Compliance Professionals, the NSCP. She is responsible for ensuring that the mission of NSCP is fulfilled through programs, strategic planning, and regulatory outreach. Ms. Crossley joined, plan excuse me, Ms. Crossley joined NSCP as its regulatory compliance liaison in 2010, being promoted to deputy executive director in 2013. Ms. Crosley has been a member of NSCP for 23 years, serving on its board of directors from 2003 to 2006. Her prior professional positions include vice president and chief compliance officer for Spectrum Asset Management, a subsidiary of Principal Global Investors, vice president and director for compliance for Nuveen Investments, Inc., where she was responsible for the firm's investment advisor, broker-dealer, and mutual fund compliance programs, and associate general counsel and chief compliance officer with Calvert Investments. Ms. Crossley received her BA from the University of Vermont and JD from the Catholic University of America Columbus School of Law. Vina Lacundi, Vina, if you could just... Vina, jo Vina is the Vice President Chief Compliance Officer of 3M. Vina Lacundi joined 3M more than 24 years ago. During her time at 3M, she has proven herself as a global leader, a scientist, businesswoman, and strategist. She was the first female managing director in 3M Indonesia before becoming a global business director in 3M's industrial business group. Now 3M's Chief Compliance Officer, Vina is leveraging her business experience to build a world-class global organization that is committed to doing the right thing every day, and she is giving back whenever she can. 
Some of my proudest moments are when I'm able to reach out, out a hand to help fellow 3Mers accomplish their goals and ultimately help grow the company, Venus says. She is a passionate volunteer and a current member of the Minnesota Independent School Forum Board, which focuses on STEM programming, and the Twin Cities United Way Women United Community Relations Committee. At 3M, she is the chair of 3M A3 Action Asian American Employee Resource Network and is on the executive committee of the Women's Leadership Forum. Vina also brings a strong science and engineering background to 3M. Her first job with the company was as a product engineer in Canada. I value my background in science, she says. It is the core foundation of my skills that allows me to think critically and act collaboratively in all that I do. Her strong business acumen, people leadership skills, and customer first attitude has enabled her to succeed in a broad range of career opportunities globally, including research and development, sales and marketing management, Six Sigma, and senior business leadership. Vina holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry and Chemical Engineering from the University of Western Ontario in Canada. She enjoys spending time with her family and traveling to new countries. Katie Lawler, right next to her, is the Senior Vice President and Global Chief Ethics Officer of U.S. Bank. In this role, Katie leads the U.S. Bank Corps Office of Global Ethics and Business Conduct. In 2016, Katie returned to the Law Division as Deputy General Counsel resp responsible for the Employment and Labor, Technology and Operations, Cybersecurity, Privacy, and Data Governance legal teams. Prior to returning to the Law Division, Katie served in a variety of roles in human resources, most recently as Senior Vice President and Director of Talent and Employee Relations. During her tenure in Human Relations, Katie led groups including Employee Relations, Diversity and Inclusion, Communications, Leadership Development, and Talent Management, Employee Engagement, and Employee Prescreening. -screen, pre Katie joined U.S. Bank in 2002 as an Employment Attorney in the Law Division and served as Chief Employment Counsel prior to moving to Human Resources in 2007. Among Katie's proudest accomplishments include founding the U.S. Bank Employee Assistant Fund and the award-winning Proud to Serve program and leading U.S. Bank's ethics program that helped U.S. Bank be named as one of the world's most ethical companies. Katie is a member of the Board of Trustees of Wallen Education Partner, Partners, serves on the Finance Advisory Committee for the St. Louis Park Public Schools, and is a member of the Human Resources Advisory Committee of Fraser. Katie is a licensed attorney and a member of the Minnesota Bar Association, the Association of Corporate Counsel, the Ethics and Compliance Initiative, and the Business Ethics Leaders Alliance. Katie received her BA from Rice University in Houston, Texas, and her JD from the University of Houston Law Center. She lives with her husband and two children in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. Joanne Jerick Mullen, Chief Compliance Officer and Associate General Counsel of Ecolab. At Ecolab, Joanne is responsible for ensuring that all employees worldwide understand and adhere to Ecolab's global compliance mandates. Her work includes implementing and maintaining the ethics and compliance program with a focus on anti-corruption activities and code of conduct compliance. Her team and she manages investigations, trainings, develop policies, assesses risk, creates and distributes communications, as well as due diligence protocols for intermediaries and acquisitions. She also manages all aspects of employment law issues, including litigation, EEOC, Department of Labor and other charges, union labor consult, job classifications issues, policy development and implementation, long-term strategy human resources planning, and other employment-related issues. She works closely and manages outside counsel from around the world and is accountable to senior leadership regarding the health of Ecolab's compliance and employment policies and practices. Joanne has been practicing for over 25 years, first in private practice and then in her own business, where she worked with large and small corporations, colleges and universities, 
on issues as varied as policy development and implementation, employment-related issues, workplace satisfaction training, me med mediation facilitation, and compliance reporting. She's been recognized by her peers as a leading Minnesota woman attorney and has been honored by the Minnesota State Bar Association as Attorney of the Year. She is a frequent speaker around the country regarding current employment and compliance issues. Joanne serves on many nonprofit boards, including her alma mater, St. Catharines University, and is chair of the board of, at Convent of Visitation School, the only all-girls junior and senior high school in the state of Minnesota. In her free time, she likes to ski, golf, travel, read, and enjoy time with family and friends. Kim Adi. Did you oh, raise your <clears throat> We should have had little name tags out there. Kim Adi is Mayo Clinic's Chief Compliance Officer. The Mayo Clinic Integrity and Compliance Office helps to identify compliance strategy for all sites and all shields of Mayo Clinic with a goal to entrust to ensure trust of our patient, employees, regulators, and the public. Kim started her career at Mayo Clinic in 2002 as a lawyer in the legal department focusing on regulatory issues including Medicare, HIPAA, and fraud and abuse. Prior to joining Mayo Clinic, Kim worked on a large HMO in their legal and public policy department and as a health lawyer in private practice. Kim has been an adjunct professor of health law and bioethics at the University of Minnesota, William Mitchell and Hamlin. Kim holds a JD from the University of Minnesota and a master's in philosophy from the University of Minnesota with areas of expertise in biomedical ethics. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you we've so much. We've all made notes to shorten our bios. What? We've all made notes to shorten our bios. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we talked about whether or not I was going to read their whole bios, and I decided, you know, when you accomplish that much, you should, you should get your bio read, don't you think? So I think we should give them a round of applause. Okay, so we've, we've separated out our agenda here today in three main topics. The first topic that we're going to go through is really about the challenges and rewards of being a strong female leader in this space, compliance and ethics. And so um, the questions that, that, that I will ask um, will really be to the panelists as a whole. If there are any questions whatsoever from the audience, Jenna is over here and she has a microphone, so please don't hesitate to interrupt at any point with any questions. The panelists all um, really have um, wanted me to encourage that to happen. So one of the, the first question I have is, what are some specific examples of challenges and rewards of being a strong female leader in this space that you can share with the audience? Katie, I'm going to start with you. I think for me, one of the greatest uh, rewards really is the Can you hear her? My mic's not on. Okay, all right. Um, I think for me, one of the greatest rewards really has been that opportunity to connect with women at all different stages of their career. Um, I've got several ongoing me mentoring relationships that have developed over the past few years, and I think I get more out of that than my mentees do. Um, Go right in front of it. Right in front of it. I have to talk into it. All right. Well, we're going to get close, Vina. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just that ability to connect with women um, throughout at all levels of their careers. For me, developing these mentorship relationships that I have over the past few years has been incredibly rewarding because I think I get as much out of it, if not more, than the mentee does. Um, and so there's some you know, opportunity for reverse mentoring, but just to connect with women, um, to help them make connections internally. I've been at the bank for 16 years, and I've been in roles where I've worked with, almost, with pretty much every business group in the company, so I know a lot of people. And so it's fun for me to be able to help women make those connections and entry points into other parts of the bank, which isn't always easy to do. And so to be able to help them connect, think about what they're interested in, and then having had the HR background I have, to really be able to think about what are your strengths, what are you interested in doing, and then being able to help them make those connections internally so that we can see great talent move around in our company is hands down the most rewarding thing for me. What about challenges? I don't have any challenges. <laughs> 
We'll come back to you. <laughs> okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. So, so first I just have to say, I'm relatively new to this space. So it's been just over a year and I have to tell you, I've never seen such a, two things. One is, this is the most collaborative profession that I've ever seen and I've been in many different parts of 3M company. So I think, acknowledge or understand that this is a very collaborative com profession because there's no competition in ethics. Right? Everybody wins if, if people are, are ethical. And I think another reward is when you're in this space, you have the ability to impact the enterprise that you're part of, right? So, so in different roles, you might have like a little piece that you're, you're driving forward or you're contributing to. This is really, I have more accountability that I put on myself in this role than any business I've ever run because I now think of the 91,000 people and making sure that, you know, I'm accountable for, for the company's, you know, progress with my team, many of whom are here today, but, you know, that kind of, that's a different feeling. So I think that's a rewarding experience. And on the challenge side, I would say um, you're still subject to the same assumptions and stereotypes about women, uh, being a women leader in this space as you are in any other space that I would suggest that you might think about over your career. Um, you know, like being bossy, or we call those leadership skills now, or having to, you know, influence people who are primarily, depending on what company and what, what area, are primarily male, right? So, so still having those influence skills to make change and transform things, I think those challenges are, are the same here as they are in several other um, prof professions that you could go into. I don't think my mic, is my mic on? Okay, great. So let me tell you a little bit about Ecolab. First of all, we have about 50,000 employees in 172 countries. And a lot of my work means that I have to visit many of the employees in a lot of those different countries. In fact, in the last three months, I've been to Rio, I've been to Dubai, I've been to South Africa, I've been to Japan, I've been to, um, boy, Indonesia, Singapore. And so some of the challenges are also some of the rewards, and I'll give you a couple examples. The reward, many times I'm the only woman in the world, in the room, in that world of where Ecolab is. That's also a challenge. It depends in what part of the world you're in. So for instance, when I was in Dubai, I really was the only woman in the room um, in many of our meetings. And it took a while to, I guess, earn the trust or the credibility because I was a woman and it's a part of the country that I was told that it would be a little more difficult. Um, you know, the, the wonderful opportunity and the wonderful reward is by the end, because I was prepared, because I had good team there to help me understand the culture and the issues, um, the reward was we had some fantastic meetings and our work was done. So another challenge, of course, I was just a week ago in Brazil, which has many compliance rewards and challenges too. And I was there for meetings and once again, I was the only woman in the room on many of these meetings. We're in the energy services space too, which is predominantly male if you understand that work. And so um, the meetings were good meetings. We weren't there on an investigation. It was more of a meet and greet for Joanne and also to roll out our compliance and ethics committee. But it took a couple days actually, really before I could feel, um, I don't know, the temperature change a little bit, like maybe, I did know what I was talking about, even though I was a female, even though my predecessor was a male. And they kept asking me questions, well, would Mike, who's my predecessor, do this? Or how would Mike handle that? So the third day, the reward was in this meeting, and this is an example, the leader of the country came up to me afterwards and said he wanted me to come back and he wanted me actually to meet with customers of ours to talk about compliance because he thought a woman compliance person might have more impact with these businesses um, than a male. And so, again, you have the rewards of being a woman many times, but you also have the challenges of being a woman, especially in the space of Ecolab, where I'm in so many different countries. Thank you. 
So good afternoon, everyone. This, uh, I'm Kim Adi. Uh, I won't repeat some of the same things. I, you know, being a part of relationships with uh, uh, colleagues and mentoring are, are some of the greatest, greatest days. And I, I love some of your the stories you just told too. Let me let me focus a little bit on a little bit of a different tack, opportunity and challenge female compliance leader. So I'm not sure that this opportunity and, channel and challenge, does it attach to the female part, the compliance part, or the leader part? I think it all gets kind of mushed together. But to me, that is the opportunity and the challenge of strategic influence. And I do think, so I spent 10 years as a lawyer. As a lawyer, you get a little bit of power just by title and law. Compliance, the most interesting thing to me in this gig the past five years, so I was an attorney for about 20 in private practice and in-house, and then the last five as the compliance officer. Uh, the most interesting, challenging thing, good and bad, has been that strategic influence and how you play that card um, effectively. And different seats are different. As I, this, these things like this always do make you feel, they make you reflect and they make me feel old. Um, you you play that strategic influence card differently depending on what chair you're in. So I don't know, speaking from my experience, my values, my principles haven't tremendously changed, but the tactics I take for strategic influence have changed. Um, so one thing that it makes me think of an opportunity, and again, I don't know if this is the female, the compliance, or the leader part, but I recall fairly early on in this gig, I felt pretty strongly about a particular issue and I had brought it up with one of our leaders a number of times. I had given him, in this case, a chance to have the conversation I felt like he needed to have. We would talked about it a number of times. He called me on Saturday and Sunday to have further discussion. And what I had said is on Monday at a 2 o'clock meeting, it's on my agenda and I'll be, I'll be covering this. So on Monday at the board meeting, I get pulled aside beside the coffee. And the comment I got was... Um, okay, so tell me again, you're just so earnest. And I looked at him and I said, no, I'm not earnest, I'm peeved. And I didn't really use peeved, but I was very quiet. Um, to me, that's a little bit of the challenge that I think is, at least if we're talking about compliance, I, um, that's, compliance can be a little bit ambiguous and to me depends a lot more in, on, on influence than some of my other jobs. And how you play that card in what seat to be strategic, I think is, is how, is what I focus on most as the challenge in this position. Hi, good afternoon, I'm Lisa Crossley. Um, I'm, I'm a follow up on what Kim has to say. Um, just for a little bit of background, because I come from financial services where compliance is, is a relatively new field. Um, I started in the business in 1988 when I was 10. Um, no. <laughs> And um, back, you know, back then there, there wasn't compliance and I was working at Le Shearson Lehman Brothers, which no longer exists, but it was completely male dominated in the traditional, there were the traditional roles of the, all the sales assistants were female and, and the males had broker positions or trading positions. And so I, you know, I watched um, and I actually had the benefit of having a very strong male figure, my father, who worked in the same office with me. And I used to watch and, and say, you know, so-and-so is, you know, you know, he, you know they, they don't seem to understand what they're doing or they don't seem to be in compliance. And, and you know, watching the, the paradigms that went, you know, went on between the male and female and how the females were, were quite suppressed. So I think the challenge for me is that I was a strong female. I knew that I wanted to do more than to be a sales assistant or bond assistant. So my, my father always said to me, watch and listen and traverse carefully. Do not complain. Make sure that you have solutions for your, your pro, you know, the issues that you bring up. And I always have taken that with me through my career. And as I've gotten, you know, I think that that's, that's such an important part for us as in a compliance profession, is you're solving problems. You are basically a project manager. And with my background as attorney, I'm like, I always want to, let's start at A, and before you know, we go down to, to Z. And so always going back and looking at 
who's influenced, who, are, who needs to be involved, who is this affecting, and being able to work collaboratively with people. You're going to have times where there's pushback on that, but you always should stay your course, never criticize, never, and, and you know, try to put forth your ideas as best as you can and show the benefit of them. So that's always been a challenge, and that's still a challenge for me in my role as executive director of an association, though the staff is five women and we work really great together. I have a board and I have uh, members who don't always, you know, we don't always agree eye to eye. I think one of the, for me, the, um, the, the greatest benefit that I've had um, and reward that I've had is having someone come back years later and saying, you know, we really miss you as our CCO. You were wonderful to work with. You listened to us. And um, I always prided myself to being able to say to my business units, here's the law. We're not going to be strict. I'm going to find a way to stretch it for you and let, we'll find a solution that works. So I was sort of making sure I'm part of the team. But being respected and acknowledged for that afterwards, um, for me, was probably one of the greatest rewards. As well as mentoring, I do quite a bit of mentoring with male and female in the compliance space because I truly think it's, it's very, very important to give back. Um, I can remember my troubles and issues and I joined NSCP and there were many women before me who mentored me, so um, I do have strong belief in that. Subject. Um, you talked about, you know, your dad telling you not to complain and, you know, to really, there's articles that I've read that have talked about, you know, why is it on the female to figure out how to really work around this male-dominated whatever in industry that you're in. For, the, for our audience members who are generally, um, well, there's no general. I think we have a, a mix here from students to alumni that are you know, beginning their career to some that are in the middle of their career, some that are in a more senior role. And you know, what, what, what advice would you give them to um, navigate sort of those taboo areas? You know, what, what do you think that would be helpful? You know, I think as, um, as you gain success in your life, it's hard to, to, con to go back and look through the lens of when you were getting up to that ladder, and that's really what I'm asking for you all to do right now, is what, what did you do when you were climbing up into the pinnacle of your career, which you're all at now, that you think was really beneficial to you that this audience can benefit from hearing about? Katie? Well, I think some of the taboos still exist and it's somewhat unfortunate. You know, women can't, women can't get emotional. Men can get angry, they can get upset, and that's them being strong and dominating and women are being emotional females, right? So uh, that is, I think, an unfortunate taboo that primarily still exists. Um, what I think has changed is the ability, though, as women to kind of bring our whole self to work, which in the past, you know, we, were, we basically were supposed to pretend we didn't have a life outside of work. We didn't have children. We didn't have families. We, we just we showed up every day, and that was it, and we did our job, and we didn't talk about anything else. And I think that that has changed. And I think it's actually incumbent on women who have um, moved, advanced in their organizations to, to be open about some of those challenges. Um, when I was in HR at the bank for uh, about eight years, I managed our employee relations team. And I actually had the youngest children on the team. And I learned a lot from my team. But I also learned once I had children what a naive person I had been <laughs> and didn't understand the needs that my working moms all had. Um, and, and so I became, I think, a much better manager, a much better leader because I was more empathetic. Um, and I think being open about that this isn't easy. Um, is really important. Um, that's just something I feel so strongly about. And I mean, I mean, it's not easy. And I would come to work and, I mean, just be open. I was fortunate at that time my team was all women. Um, but even now with a, with a mixed team, we do talk about our families. We do talk about the challenges. I've got, you know, guys on my team who share the load with their wives. On, if somebody's sick, they're actually the ones who have to stay home. And that used to be unheard of. Um, 
So I do think a lot has changed in that regard, that we are allowed to be women in the workplace. But I think some of the stereotypes in that Vina referenced earlier still exist. Um, and especially around being emotional, being bossy, those things. And, and it is somehow left to us to try to figure that out and, and figure out how to navigate it instead of the men to adapt to it. But I think that's starting to change a little bit. So, so what I would say is, um, I think it evolves over time. So when I started my career, I think I would use humor to try to diffuse a lot of situations, right? And, and I was very clear, though, if I was uncomfortable, I would just walk away. And, and there were a couple of times where, I, when I was a sales rep, that I actually had to just do that, whether it was with fellow colleagues or with customers or other people, just kind of walk away and, and remove myself from the situation. I think... As I evolved to more mid, you know, after maybe 10 years, I think then I said, well, you know what, if I want things to change, I have to be part of the change. So I can't just cope and deal. I have to start getting involved and being part of that change. And I think that's just amplified from then till now. So, so things are not, you know, we all reference it. Things are not ideal, right? Until we get better gender balance everywhere, you're still going to have people who unfortunately take advantage of whether it's their power, their, their, you know, the, the power distance that they have or whatever it is. But for me, then it just became how much, how can we accelerate being part of the change? The other thing I would say is, you know, if you join a company, if the company's values and culture don't align with your personal values, you're going to be tired every day, probably by noon, right? Because every fiber of your being is fighting against what you would naturally be doing. So I think, you know, you may start somewhere, you may not stay there, and that's okay. But, but as much as those two can align, then you can just build on and be part of the change within that environment. And so I think that's, that's something that I would kind of offer up to you early is evaluate where you're going and don't feel like you have to stay, right? I mean, you'll get a job. This field is so needed, and ex experts in this field are so needed. Uh, and so, you know, you'll have more options than you can dream of, but you want to be somewhere where you're valued um, and where you can be part of the change. It, it won't be, it'll never be done. You know, one thing that I've learned and continue to learn in this role is you need to ask for what you want. You do. And I'll give an example. So I was a litigator. I was another very few women in the litigation field when I was practicing law. And I remember I was involved in a big piece of litigation in front of federal court. And federal court can be pretty, um, you know, pretty conservative. It was back then. Um, still is in some jurisdictions. And I was pregnant with my first child, and I was so miserably morning sick. Any of you have been pregnant and know that. But listen, I had to trudge on through. I was very well prepared, but when it would be time for me to get up, you know, I'd not feel well, and I'd get through and make it through. And, and then I would leave and just hope that I said something that made sense. And I did this for a couple of weeks and still sick. And so finally I thought you know what, I'm just going to ask for what I need, and next time I feel sick, I'm just going to tell the judge, I need to take a break. And honest to goodness, and this was a judge that was quite conservative, quite male, had all male clerks. Um, I was not feeling well, and I was doing well, though. I was prepared, and I asked the judge as soon as I was not feeling well, you know, Your Honor, I have to excuse myself. I'm pregnant, I'm suffering morning sickness, and honest to goodness, the whole tenor of that litigation changed. Suddenly, this judge got this look in the eyes. I don't know if it was fear, or like, oh my goodness, this woman's gonna <laughs> pass out. Um, but suddenly, he became more sensitive, and he would ask if I needed some time. And this was about a month-long trial piece of litigation. And it certainly made it easier for me. It made it easier for the counsel that was against me, too, because this judge really, I think, understood, not only do we have you know, a well-prepared attorney, because honest to goodness, I was well-prepared, but somebody who's human and is going to get through this, but she's going to get through this with accommodation. And so again, ask for what you need, and you will be surprised. You will be surprised. It's hard to remember that sometimes. That makes me think about, so jumping off on that, um, 
I was just telling our co my colleague here that I was at a conference lately and I was supposed to be a speaker and I walk in early because I'm prepared and I want to I always like to see what the front looks like and where I'm speaking from and make sure my PowerPoint is ready and I noticed what they had set up so it's three women set up with three bar stools in the front with no table and no skirt and I had a skirt on you know so I said hey we're gonna have to rearrange the front of this since there's three women here to speak and you know we can't sit on these bar stools in front of 200 people so ask for what you need all they had to do was change those change the chairs out and give me a table with a skirt um, so I would say uh, uh, not only you can't have it all but more importantly one of my major lessons learned is you don't want it all understand who you are there's that one playbook that we all think we have to play to there's no one playbook. Each of us has our own playbook. It doesn't mean you have to be general counsel. It doesn't mean you have to be, as my mother would fully expect, the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, literally, I called her with this great job opportunity. I had to go to in-house, and the first thing she said was, oh, honey, does that mean you're not gonna be in uh, the Supreme Court justice? <laughs> I said, yeah, probably. Um, but you can't, you don't want it all. So in the interest of work-life balance and knowing who you are, what do you want? And there's tons of things in life that count. There's not one playbook. Find your playbook. So I, in, in terms of, I just want to circle back with ta taboos because um, what I, I have noticed is the, the power taboo. We used to be, I used to be so fearful of asking and questioning those in power. And as I've got, you know, gone up the career ladder, you know, I remember my, my first compliance job, I worked for uh, someone who was, first of all, we're talking about red flags. I should have noticed this red flag when I was interviewing in the legal department. It, the ge it general counsel was male and they were all females. And that is the flag. That's, and why, why was that a flag? I learned out later that that was his way. He had power. He felt he had power over all women, and he treated us that way. So I was ne never asked, or if I asked, I didn't know what I was talking about, et cetera. And then my next position, I was talking about this last night. I went to Naveen Investments, and the general counsel there, I went in and I said, I would like to do X, and I was charged with building a compliance department at a 100-year-old company that had decentralized compliance. So I had to, you know, go to people and say, I need your, you know, I need what you're doing for compliance, and nobody wants to give that up because it's job security. So when I came up with ideas, he finally said to me, you're like an abused child. What happened to you? You have to have belief in yourself and trust yourself and know that you are going to make some mistakes, but you're only going to learn by them. And I almost fell over, and I was like, wow, I do have some power. And um, so that power taboo shifted for me right then. And then, in my, you know, unfortunately, my next position, it sort of shifted back. So it, it existed. Some, sometimes it exists. Sometimes it doesn't. But you have to uh, traverse your way through that. So um, I, th I think it, that you're going, it, it, there's always, you know, taboos that are always going to be in place. But I think they get softened over the years. So that's sort of what I wanted to expound upon. Joanne, you mentioned this. I mean, you kind of got to it in terms of your litigation experience. and. Um, that you brought a human element when you asked to be able to take breaks. Are there, are there traits that you think uh, women bring to the compliance and ethics function, just as it generally, that um, help them in a way that, that, and I don't mean this like, you know, men, th the last, um, data that I saw indicated that, and that was, I think, from 2015, that there were 60% more women in, a, in compliance roles than men. And I guess what I'm asking, and we don't, we, we talked the, about this before the panel, that we really don't have numbers, um, current numbers, and if anyone in the audience does, that would be great to know, what, what the percentages of women in compliance and ethics may be at the CCO level compared to maybe down um, one or two levels below. But um, with respect to that, are there, are there traits do you think that women bring to the role that attract the female to this space or that make them more um, likely to succeed? I mean, I, I just wonder what is it about 
the female and why there's so many in this role? I don't know if it's because of gender, but what I see, because I have males and females on my staff, I see a curiosity with, um, I, I see it with many of my males too, but there seems to be this inert curiosity to find out more and want to know more. And that's very, very helpful in the compliance role, especially when it gets to, to the investigation piece of it. I also see perseverance. And listen, um, you know, when you've been through 20 some years of being called little lady or let me carry your briefcase or those kinds of things, you know, you learn how to persevere. And I've seen that with uh, many of my female colleagues in compliance. For instance, you know, I think you said it, said it best um, that, I don't know if it's female or compliance, but many times you're not the most popular person in the room when you have to bring to your business that there's a big investigation, a complainant has come forward with all kinds of allegations, including bribery, and oh, by the way, it's going to cost you a couple million bucks to do the investigation and all of that, and we might have to fire some of your key leaders. You're not the most popular person. And I'll tell you, many of those leaders will say to you, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and so you have to persevere through that. You have to dig deep. You have to be curious. You have to keep going, even in spite of the fact that your leader's saying, I don't want to spend that money, or I don't want you, you know, stirring around in my business. And again, I don't know if that's female, but it seems to be some traits that I have and that I've seen in many of my colleagues who are women. Um, you just have to trudge on through and be curious in this role. That's such an interesting point. So I don't want to make this role as hard for the New York Times for the weekend, but they, uh, there was somebody researched the Boston Marathon results from last week, and women were like 80% less likely to drop out in that horrendous weather mm -hmm. because they persevered. And they were trying to figure out what that was. Um, and there's other research about women, a female athletes coming back earlier from injury, they work harder, they stick, they, you know, they actually tend to get injured, re-injured more because they push to come back, but it, it, yeah. it may well correlate. You know, um, I would add, I think there's three things that having worked with women over multiple different functions and geographies, I think women are very good communicators. Mm. And I think that in this role, it's really important to be able to communicate to whatever the audience is that you are trying to you know, get your message across to. And so they also show empathy, right? So, so how do you tailor that message? So if you're speaking to someone junior, you're probably not delivering it the same way as someone who's more senior. So how do you kind of still have the same impact? I think women are very efficient. A and for those of you who are you know, working mothers, like I think all of us are, or, or, you know, or you have other responsibilities outside of work, you just figure it out, and you and you. So so when you bring that mentality to work, you're just trying to figure out how do we get things done in a more efficient way. And then a third thing I would say is that we're, women are very collaborative and they build relationships. And I think that you know sometimes people can say, oh well, you know she's friends with everybody. She can't be serious or she can't be taken seriously. You know I've been in three M for 25 years. I have built relationships throughout that 25 years across businesses and geographies that are serving me very well today. So I have people who I knew 20 years ago coming to my office to share concerns with me because they want me to know something, right? And that's because I didn't worry about who was the big people up top. It was just as I went along, I was building relationships with people mm -hmm. and getting to know them enough that they were comfortable to come back later. So I think collaborative and building relationships is also very important. Yeah, I would, I would just add, I think, you know, women, you know, in balancing, we're all project managers, and that is what compliance is, is putting, you know, the pieces of the puzzle together. So with that, it comes, you know, the detail orientation, you know, orientation, the communication skills, et cetera. Just, you know, just as, as uh, Venus said, um, in making, in being, being collaborative, having relationships at all levels of the business is extremely important. Thing. You really can't have an ego either, you know, because you can't think you're always going to win and you're going to get there until the very end. And I see more and more women who 
are collaborative, who really aren't in it to win, but rather in it to do what's best for your business. So you have to let that ego go. I'm going to ask a really hard question, but do you think that part of the reason why there's more women in ethics and compliance roles, especially at the higher levels, is because they can be paid less? I don't know. The women I know at high up in the world are not being paid less at our company. <laughs> We've got some very, very strong women in, in, in roles in compliance and, and risk management at our company who are just amazingly talented people, and I've seen us moving, you know, more and more to parity. Our company as a whole is 65% female. Overall, our 73,000 employees. But like most companies, you've got to funnel. But I would say in, in risk and compliance, now my group is separate from that, but risk and compliance, where we've got thousands of people because we're a bank, big bank in the United States these days, there are some really amazing women who have had um, incredibly big roles at other institutions that we have been fortunate enough to recruit. So I don't, I don't, I don't think there's a big pay differential, um, and I don't think that's driving it. I, I think women may be attracted to the work. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, the, the whole gender question always makes me feel very cautious, because I, I think we have to be very cautious about that as a profession. I, it feels familiar, perhaps, to like nursing or teaching. Um, so it feels like a familiar question in that sense. And I feel like going from legal to compliance, one thing I still feel strongly every day is I'm by nature an introvert. Send me to my room, shut the door, and let me analyze the Medicare regs and then write a really long, hairy memo. I'm super happy. Um, I think it's more a personality profile than a gender profile. And to the extent the personalities of kind of blue, more relationship-based, maybe more female, maybe there's that link. I don't think there's any more pay differential in our area necessarily than in other areas, but I think there's a pay differential. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I don't think it's because it's in the experience I've had compliance. I think we often don't ask for more, you know, but I don't know that that's any more endemic to compliance than any other area. So, so I would say at 3M, there are job grades or job bands, and so people, so if you're a vice president, the band is, you know, A to B for a salary, and it's adjusted for competitive market midpoint every year. So I think it's the same if you're a vice president of compliance or a vice president of a business or a vice president of a different function. So where you are in that range can be a function of many things, like your experience or, you know. But, but that, I feel, is it's not separate for this function. Like, it's not on a separate scale than the rest of the company. So I feel better about that. But if you ask anybody, nobody will tell you they're paid enough, ever of any gender or anything, so. <laughs> but I think the key there, as I've learned, is that it's the bands. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, there's some flexibility, usually, or often, within the bands. And advocacy will sometimes determine, at least in the experiences I've had, where you end up in that band. Do you guys think there's a function, though, of work-life balance? So I see a lot of lawyers leaving private practice and going to compliance, or, even, or coming in-house, and taking significant pay cuts from private practice because of the, the desire for work-life balance. Now we see that from men too, but um, but you don't want to have. But you don't, yeah. And they're yeah. willing to make that trade-off. Yep. Then, I mean, that makes me think they don't want it all. Well, why is that defined as all? you know, maybe the definition of success and what it looks like in a corporate environment or a law firm or in-house counsel could be more female friendly, if you will, because females do work differently, right? Um, because we have these other polls, but that's probably for a different day and I won't digress. Um, any questions from the audience so far for, for topic number one? All right, we're going to move on to our next topic, which is really the, the hashtag Me Too movement and how it relates to compliance and ethics and, and the role of compliance and ethics in this movement. Um, I'm going to ask Vina to start with, what are some of the shifts that you're seeing or feeling in your area of responsibility due to this movement? 
So I, I think we'll all we'll all agree that everything is more visible and more transparent today, right? So so there's a heightened sense of empowerment for people to speak up about many things. The hashtag Me Too Me movement, of course, being being front and center. You know, I think when when our company looks to to me in the chief compliance officer role, I have executives that say, well, what are we doing in this space? And depending on your company and your scope of responsibilities, you may not have direct responsibility for that area, right? So so big part of what we have to do is we have to partner across with different functions. And I'll give you an example of that. So we talk about respectful workplace principle under our code, right? And 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 I think that the, the hashtag Me Too movement fits squarely in there. And so we partnered with our diversity and inclusion team, which is part of HR, to put on an event in March that was around, we, we took five case studies and we, we worked with Penumbra Theater Group and Moo Theater Group, which are Twin Cities um, theater groups, to act those out for employees, right? So it was very powerful for people to see this happens here at 3M. And then I had a bit of a, a, a talk about what do you do if this happens? How do you raise a concern within this company, right? And then the follow-up in May with the same partnership will be active bystander. So, so you know, for me, the perfect end game is where, you know, people always should have channels for reporting, but if you have a culture that is really passionate about preserving those, the positives, people will call it out in a meeting. It won't have to be an anonymous hotline tip, it'll be, we sit in a meeting and someone goes, that doesn't play here, we don't do that here, that's not acceptable, we need to stop, right? That's kind of where we want to get to, so active bystander, but it's all about partnership. You can't do it by yourself, but you, but you know, you could say, well, it's not my job, it's somebody else's job. I would, I would say if you see a gap, step into it, because we need people to step into these and have these conversations, but partnership is the way to get it done. You know, I have a couple thoughts on this. First of all, I report to the audit committee of our board of trustees, and in our last audit committee meeting, one of the questions was, what's going on at Ecolab when it comes to Me Too, or with harassment? And it is also the first element of our code of conduct, and so we do own it. But it's funny, because in my employment law world, um, you know, we can always go to human resources and say, what are you doing with the training? What are you doing with this, that? But the question from the audit committee got me thinking about this, and it's really the business that owns this, and it's the business that has to take responsibility. We have a lot of different businesses at Ecolab, and so when a situation comes up, because we have had more complaints over the last several months because of the Me Too movement, I'll call human resources, of course, to help, but we also talk to the business leaders. So what are you doing in your business? Because you own this. Your employees own this. We all own this. And so it's not just a separate compliance and or HR matter. And I'll give you one example of this. We have a pest elimination business. And it's usually an entry level um, type business where employees are newer to their career and with the whole Me Too business, we had an employee who um, did not want to work with his partner who was a female, okay? Um, didn't want to do the servicing, and our servicing happens at night, and he was worried because of the Me Too that she would say something, maybe. You know, she would accuse him of something. Um, he was worried, was frightened, actually. And the manager of these two said, okay, that's okay. You don't have to. You don't have to ride along with her because it'll make you uncomfortable. Well, you can imagine when we heard about that, what we did and how we had to educate, again, our business as to why it's not okay to say, I won't work with that female because I'm worried that she's going to come forward with some sort of false allegation. It's like saying, I don't want to work with that person because she's old or because she's disabled or because she's somebody I don't want to work with. That's not an option. And the business, of course, sent that message. So it's really something that compliance, yes, it's part of our code, and those complaints come in many times through our, our hotline, 
but at the end of the day, the business has to take responsibility, and that's how we're going to and continue to report it to the audit committee. This is what the business is doing, not what Joanne and compliance is doing. I just want to ask a question because obviously as association we don't have, with you know, six, six room we don't have these issues, but what are you doing in terms of the consequences or, you know, the different levels of consequence? I'm just curious about that. I know when someone's saying something is I'm not going to work with someone, you just explained to them that, that you have no other choice. But what, you know, what are you saying in terms of your, the hierarchy of consequences and remedi remediation? Well, it really depends on the circumstances. So if, for instance, this employee refused to work with the coworker who's a female, well, they have that choice to do that, but then they would not be working at Ecolab. Um, you know, again, if we find that an employee is involved in harassing inappropriate conduct that is, um, you know, causing a hostile environment, um, you know, we would, depending on the circumstances, we have terminated up to and including termination. Um, if we find that a manager knows about behavior that is inappropriate, that is harassing, that is creating an environment that is not um, conducive to getting your work done and the manager fails to do anything about it, that manager might lose their job and has lost their job under our code. But as you can imagine, every circumstance is different. And you've been reading the papers over the last seven, eight months, right? And, and you know that we quickly, you know, jump to the conclusion they should be fired immediately or they should be, um, you know, this, that, or the other thing. We do a full, fair investigation before we make a determination as to how we're going to remediate, but up to and including termination, and we have. I'd say the same thing. Like we, um, what we've seen is we haven't had a, a, a significant uptick in issues. Although we are seeing more of them come in centrally within human resources because we've put out some mandates. But what we're seeing is that we've changed the way we investigate. More of them are substantiated. And we are more pushing back on some of the outcomes to say, no, that's not enough. Um, because, you know, we, we, we want to have some consistency where we can, knowing exactly, as Joanne said, every case is different. Every, excuse me, every case stand on, stands on its own merits. But... I mean, I also think, though, there's an expectation, and we, we saw that initial sort of reaction of, you know, you were, you know, guilty upon accusation, and, and you had to resign or be fired immediately, and, and you know, anybody who questioned it was, you know, was victim shaming. I think that was, that initial, you know, push seems to have, you know, abated a little bit to a little bit more recognition of due process. We have to do an investigation. We need to really look into this. Um, but I do think that, I mean, I just think that the the environment has changed such that things that in the past might have been dismissed as locker room talk, locker room banter, um, is no longer being tolerated. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I, um, I'd say two ways when I talked about the opportunity and compliance in particular is that strategic influence. Two areas related to this very, very hot topic at any company these days. I feel like, so HR kind of owns it at our shop. We certainly are a stakeholder at the table. We're influencing. The first way is um, maybe not what I would have expected is pushing for due process, keeping that due process requirement and fairness and what we call just culture on the table um, because there is some reaction here. And the second thing that I've noticed unique to this issue a little bit was uh, it was, it was, and this is one of those things that you just kind of learn and then think about how to strategically influence. We were reporting the increased numbers. It just wasn't quite getting the attention that those of us who were doing the investigations assumed it would. But we came to realize when you just said there were 10, and I'm completely making up numbers here, 10 sexual harassments, you know, um, investigations, and that's a spike from the usual three, for example. Um, that. That didn't mean a lot because a lot of people's assumption is it, it just can't be that bad. I, I don't see this. Um, and one thing we had to learn was you need to say the words that are being used in the body parts. It was an area where some specificity was necessary to get over people's presumptions that everything's okay. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. When we had the theater groups come in, I read this script and I was like, oh my goodness, we're going to say that? Right. 
And then, so I just asked our head of D D diversity and inclusion to say, just tell everybody in advance that this is the actual language that was used so that you really understand what, what was happening, right? So I think, I think the benefits of the hashtag Me Too movement, other than, you know, the biggest one is women finding their voice. And, and the second one, though, is companies have to stand up and take notice, right? So here's the thing. Um, things like in the past, oh, well, so-and-so is just like that, but they deliver great results, or everybody knows. They'll just get them some coaching, right? So like the third coaching episode. We really, we, we shouldn't be talking about coaching, right? So I think that's kind of the tolerance level for that behavior is less. Mm -hmm. And it's put people on notice, right? What was okay five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago is not acceptable today. And so part of our outreach, I completely agree with, with Joanne's comments about the business owning it. Our team, some of who are sitting here today, we went to 28 regional sales meetings in the US alone in the first quarter to dialogue with sales reps because they see things every day mm -hmm. about what's acceptable, what's not, right? I mean, and so, so it's very much a, there's outreach and there's also this less tolerance. The third, the last point I'll make is, you know, there are, there have been variations in how investigations can be conducted. And I think what we've found with this movement, it's given us the, um, empowered us to say, hey, we need some standardized process across functions, right? So if I've got a team of seven ex-FBI investigators, I know the depth of the investigations they're going to do. So we want to make sure all functions are, are carrying out some depth uh, to do it correctly, right? And we've done the same. We've had terminations of mid-senior level people and we look at organizational justice, right? You can't just be looking at the junior people and saying, well, they didn't really know. They own that atmosphere, that environment. So we have to, so it's helped us look at things differently, which I think is positive. I think one of the things that's been interesting for me is I had my pre-audit committee meeting with the chair of our audit committee in, I think, January for the January board meeting and was showing, we had some new material in our, in our presentation and he and we talked a little bit about harassment and he he said I'm glad to see this because I think you know the board will expect that the ethics office has a has a role to play here and one of the challenges that that I see with that is that HR thinks that's their wheelhouse right that that's HR's wheelhouse and so it develops a little bit of a natural tension of HR saying we got this and, and so having to develop that strategic influence and partnerships is really important because, you know, we all, we all should be working together on this and it shouldn't be territorial, but sometimes you, you run into that. But I would say that is one of the challenges. Um, but being able to develop those relationships and have that influence and input is really, is really important. What about, um, do you, I guess this is kind of a, a very simple question, but do you think it's here to stay? I mean, I think we have some trends that we see um, over the course of the last few years, and sometimes they fall off um, gun control, and you know, they might, it might hit the papers and be in the media very strongly for, for a little while, and then it kind of starts to die down. Is this one here to stay? Lisa, what's your thought on that? I think it's here to stay as long as the that the the movement. It's like it's it can't be looked at as a, mo a moment. It's got to be looked at as a movement, and you know, similar to the women's movement, this is going to have a, to be a movement. Movement, but there's going to have to be ownership for the men to understand that this is their problem. Women don't harass themselves. They don't. Uh, you know, rape themselves, they don't violate themselves. So it has to start there, and that there's the greater understanding that it's similar to what's going on in the workplace, the ownership level has to be, you know, I was gonna talk about this a little bit later, but this is a, a cultural and social issue in that when we look at how boys and girls are brought up, boys are told to be tough and strong and competent, and it all cost to stay away from girls if they are going to, you know, we have the affection and, um, and 
uh, respect of, of the other boys. And so it's a socialization issue that has to be corrected at that level. And so as we see that possibly being changed, like I know with my son, who's 15 years old and very impressionable right now and obviously is, you know, is very interested in girls, that well, talking about respect with him and that you never you know, joke with your buddies about women or degrade them or say anything disparaging. So it has, I think it has to start there first. And then in, in that will convert you know, generation after generation into it being you know, a foundation in society which will be part of a business. So I think, you know, I could talk more on this, but I think it is here to stay as long as we all take ownership, you know, the, not women necessarily, but men take ownership in it. Be aware, as we said, you can't be, you know, a, a bystander. You have to speak up. And it's not unmanly to do that, and you're not gonna be looked at any differently. I've been in situations where, you know, my, you know, my superior, somebody was, you know, being degrading to a woman or to a man who wasn't as manly as they thought that they should be, and I've spoken and said, you know, that's inappropriate. But I, you know, I have had, to, but I shouldn't have to even say that. Uh, and why was it a woman that had to say that? Um, I was telling the story last night that um, I, th there was an incident in my um, my last position uh, that where the, where a portfolio manager who was a Caucasian male was just got into a frenzy and was berating um, another portfolio ma manager who was Indian and there had always been tension between them now mind you there are nine other men sitting by them and this berating is going on and on and my office is next door and I had to get up and say stop what are you doing this is not appropriate so it, that, I think more and more as, as women speak up and men also speak up for corrective behaviors, then we'll see the change along. And then that will, I think, converge with the business changes also. This is going. And I think we're, you know, I, I see this moving beyond har sexual harassment to more general rules of civility and behavior in the workplace. And I think we're gonna see it really turn into anti-bullying in the workplace um, and elsewhere. You know, we're moving away from that legal focus on her sexual harassment and the legal definition. I was talking to a friend of mine, a former, a former colleague from private practice who's at another firm now, and we were talking about this, and he said, I feel like maybe we lawyers did our clients a disservice for many years by focusing on the legal standard of harassment instead of saying that behavior is not okay. And I think that's where it's going. And, and again, I, I think that's, you know, that's a good thing, but it's also going to be a hard thing to manage. Question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I'm curious to know, is it the compliance organization within each of your organizations that conduct the investigations, maybe related to the Me Too movement, or is it HR? And some of you have said that, so I just want to be clear with all of your organizations. And then related to that, if it is HR, is anybody providing training as far as how to conduct the investigation? How do you ensure compliance with the code? You know, just to ensure consistency, because consistency is a big risk here, too. I would conduct those investigations in our company, and we have a centralized team that we stood up last year that has been specially trained, and that is their full-time job is as HR investigators and they would handle all of those investigations, unless it was one where we needed to outsource it. Yeah, I, I would say the same. The investigations are done by our employee relations team within HR, and um, our head of investigations um, in compliance, he actually runs workshops with all functions and in different geographies on how to conduct an investigation and you know what are the things you have to think about when you're going through it. So we try to train across functions. I take the hotline in, but per usual process, HR would do the employee relations investigations. I would note we're also a school, so compliance does house and we're responsible directly for the Title IX investigations. And that's been a huge learning curve as that has um, spiked up appropriately in reaction to the Me Too movement. So at Ecolab, it's 
It's usually HR that does the investigations, but we have an attorney, an employment attorney who's assigned to monitor or manage those investigations, and we do train on how to investigate. If it's a real high um, profile person involved, I'd probably get involved in the investigations, maybe with the support of outside counsel. I think part of Cammie's question was, is that training specific to sexual harassment? I mean, is it really specialized training that has changed because of the movement? Have you seen any changes because of, uh, you know, the magnitude of what we're seeing? No. Okay. Any other questions? What do you think, um, what, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm curious about the global companies, how you ensure that your message is consistent across the company, but you're also dealing with um, different cultures that maybe some things are considered appropriate that wouldn't be here? Sure, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I have a Cracker Jack staff, one of whom, two who are here, who help to make sure that our message is consistent, our communications are co consistent. We also have regional compliance um, folks all over the world that, are, that meet and hear what we are hoping our message to be our communication messages. Now, of course, we take into account to the, um, the culture, that's important, but Ecolab is a very high standard, and you know, harassment is harassment is harassment, regarding what the culture is, um, regarding where, where you work. But we do, um, we do make sure that the message is the same consistently around the globe. I would say, so for those, um, maybe talk a little bit about 3M. So as I mentioned earlier, we have 91,000 people. We have sales in over 200 countries, and we have physical presence, whether it's offices, labs, customer centers, and over 80. And so we have a global team. So I have a regional team in Latin America, a team in Europe, Middle East Africa, and a team in Asia. And we do a lot of centralized programming, but then the teams translate, so language, local language is very important. And, and you know, you can't use Google Translator and you can't always use a formal translation effort. You have to have people who speak the language. Uh, we also partner with our legal affairs team in many countries. You know, we have legal affairs people in those countries, so they also work with us to make sure we're deploying, um, you know, we call it, we call it bringing the code to life or living the code, right? So using the word compliance, having been on in different roles most of my career gets you a very different reaction when you talk about high integrity leadership or sustainable growth. So, so the words we use, the culture, and then we have what we call local compliance contact. So not part of our team, part of the countries or part of the organizations, um, we have about 85 people, and that number's growing, that sit in the countries that are kind of extensions that work two ways. One is they can help us get the messages out and then they also are kind of the pulse of the organization for us to provide us with input on themes that we need to focus on. So I have a follow-up question on the training. Um, when, when, Kim, you talked earlier about how when you started to call out the body parts that were involved, then it started to get attention. And Vina, when you're talking about 3M's um, skits that they put on, is, is that relatively new and is that a technique or some, you know, a way to, for those in the audience that are responsible for training and to really get some attention maybe that they need on the issue? You know, I would say maybe. I, I think it may be analogous in other areas too. It just maybe was less obvious. I can imagine our statistics on discrimination investigations my learning may be we need to share more specificity on those to help people understand this is the level of behavior that actually does take place. Because I think we've all been there, at least also, I've been in the situation a number of times the last year and a half where I just can't believe it. Um, but some of the specificity is needed, I think, 
to move the needle faster on, nope, some of this is happening, this is the facts, and it merits a different level of reaction. So I think the learnings, at least for me, may extend beyond this. Yeah, and I would say that um, we're trying, you have to constantly be experimenting. So there's no kind of one and done or this is it, right? Because you know what works here may not be the, as relevant in other parts of the world. But, but we're trying because we know that, okay, we, we do online, everybody probably does some form of online training. I'm not sure if you test the retention of that training, how effective that is. So how do you engage people? You know, that has to be kind of the, the outcome. So that was one way. It definitely did engage people. Um, but I think we're constantly experimenting. Yeah, it's iterative. Yeah, yeah it's iterative. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that we are doing at Ecolab is we have compliance and ethics committees in now each region in the world. So that's seven. I believe we're in Asia Pacific, Europe, Russia, China, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and I think I'm, oh, and, and MEA, Middle East Africa. And as part of those meetings, we meet three times a year. We're incorporating, um, first of all, what's going on in your region investigation wise, so we report on those. And as Kim said, kind of that aha moment for the leaders. The committee's made up of the region leaders. And they're like, really, that's happening here? Yes, it is. And then strategizing as to how we're going to train or communicate or, and or plan our programming around what's happening in each individual region. I think just one point. Um, we have a full-time commu communication manager in our group, right? So, so that becomes very important because if you think about, businesses think about customer experience, customer journey, user experience all day long. Well, we should be thinking about the employee experience, right? At what point do they have to make critical decisions about the way they're gonna conduct business and how do they like to receive information? And so having people who have that background and some kind of insights background becomes really important. So, so I think that's something to consider if you haven't already. Yeah, I have two layers of communications people that support us. One I have within my team, um, I have a team that's uh, one of the groups on my team is education and awareness. And I also then have our corporate communications team that makes sure everything is on brand and consistent and all that. But my folks are really charged with thinking innovatively. How can we get messages out through various media that, that get people's attention, that can I get, have that hook that people want to know more? And so we're experimenting with videos, we're experimenting with infographics and other types of things. We have, while well, the vast majority of our employees are in the US, we have over 3,600 physical locations because of all of our branches. And it's just not feasible to get out to every site. So we have to find ways to engage our employees remotely um, in a lot of, of instances. So using webinars and WebExes and doing conference calls, finding those vehicles that already exist and finding ways to get out there, but to make sure the content is interesting and engaging to the employees. And so I'm, you know, we're fortunate that I, I do have those kind of two layers of folks to help us. Yeah. On, this, on this question, as I'm thinking about this, we have taken some learnings from the privacy world. So thinking about the compliance programs, um, thank you, the compliance program, which is the job of compliance. In the privacy world, we fought for quite a long time to say, so we're terminating people if they violate a patient record, but we're using our usual HR approach, which is we don't give any information about why your colleague is now no longer showing up at work, right, out of respect for that terminated employee. And while that's valid and a long-standing principle, what was happening in the privacy world was the assumption in the absence of more information was that they were getting fired for nothing, that they had maybe just accidentally faxed it to the wrong person. Well, that's not why they were getting fired. So we really had to do, and compliance got very, very involved in influencing a little bit of a culture shift to be a little bit more tolerant of sharing more of the facts. We're not gonna scarlet letter the individual, and in particular, in any community that counts, but Rochester's a relatively small community, so that person is still going to live amongst us and need to find another job, probably at Mayo, frankly. Um, <laughs> um, but if, um, 
so we really kind of evolved the culture, and that was a very collaborative work between compliance, legal, HR, to make sure that after a termination, there was very explicit education back to the work unit. Again, no scarlet letter on the individual, but some scenarios that shared the concept of, here's three examples of where you don't get fired, they're accidents. In a just culture, you might, you know, you might get coaching. Here's three examples of, um, that may and do lead to termination. That quelled the rumor mill immediately. And what I see happening, which is exactly what should happen, is the learning from those years is now expressly being brought into the sexual harassment discussions at the top levels. And I think that exact same learning will inform um, the post discussions with the units, with the organization, with leadership around sexual harassment too. Yeah, I think that, 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 that rumor mill is really, is really powerful. I mean, I, look at what NPR had to do with Garrison Killer, right? right? I mean, they, they shared in gory detail all of the, the issues there. We never would have, um, you know, as an employment lawyer, does that just, makes you cringe, right? <laughs> we never would share that information, but I think more and more because there is this, this fear that there's a rush to justice in some cases that, that it is forcing us to talk a little bit more about it to show that it's, there is organizational justice, but that there is also parity and that we, that, and that there is, um, you know, we're looking at, I, the word escapes me, but we're looking at how, you know, the, each case is, is, on, is on its own merits. And so there's not just one size fits all. And so being able to share examples, whether you sanitize them and, and publish them on your internet or something to show people how issues get handled also demystifies the process. I just, I just want to add in terms of training that you have to take into consideration the demographics of your trainees. Um, we found as an association that our millennials are obviously very tech and social media focused. We're all um, our baby boomers, you know, they, I still like to print and write out um, myself. So I think in terms of training, how, you know, what is the most effective means to getting your message across has to be taken into consideration. So oftentimes on an association level, like we, we have a, a monthly newsletter and you can read that online, you can print it out, but now we have it in podcasts because we got feedback back from our Linnell group that they would like to, to listen to um, the, you know, someone, the, uh, the, excuse me, the message, then, then have to, to read it. And they obviously, more, it's more efficient for them, they're on a train, et cetera, at the time. So I think when you're training to make sure that you, you know, m you know, focus your training and the best means of that training on the demographic groups also. Tomisha, did you have a question? Well, just wait one second. She's going to bring over the mic. So a couple of you guys made a great points about how you are getting the message out, right? Whether that's through training, webinars, engaging employees. But I'm curious of how do you guys change the culture where people are willing to step up and talk about it? Um, let's say, i.e., I'm an employee, but my director that I'm reporting to that it may be an issue there and they're worried about their jobs. Because getting the message out is okay, but changing the culture where people are willing to step up and um, not worry about their jobs when they're voicing their issues, I think can be a particular concern. So, I think that's a great point. I think, um, you know, if you think about the two reasons, primary reasons people don't speak up about concerns, one is fear of retaliation. The other one is fear of inaction. So I put myself out there, nothing happens, right? Um, you know, we provide everybody with multiple channels for reporting. So we, we will say, you know, if it's not your supervisor, go to your supervisor, because we want everybody to own this culture of doing things the right way. But if it, say it was about a supervisor, then we have, you know, you can go to HR, you can go to your legal counsel, you can go to someone from our team, you can go to what we call 3methics.com, right? And in most countries, you can report as a known reporter or anonymously. And, and so sometimes people choose that route because they're just, you know, they're not comfortable, they don't, they may be new, they don't know who they can kind of trust, even though, you know, we kind of give multiple avenues. And then once that data's in, we also track, um, 
retaliation cases. So what will happen is investigations from our team. Um, our investigators will follow up with the reporters where it's a known reporter, you know, like three months, six months after to just make sure, see if anything's changed. Because that's the other part, right? Retaliation can be quite subtle. It doesn't always have to be the person gets demoted. It can be exclusion. It can be other kinds of different behavior. So that's one, one thing that we do. We've been focused, you know, everybody talks about it having a speak up culture, getting people to speak up. And so we've really tried, in my group, we're trying to shift that conversation to a listen up culture. Because we can ask our employees to speak up all we want, but if our leaders aren't prepared to listen and respond appropriately and, and take action and let that employee feel heard and valued and respected for coming forward, they're not gonna continue to speak up. So we're really trying to shift that by, by building that skill set with our leaders. So talking to them about how do you practice active listening? How do you, you, know, how do you respond when somebody comes to you? But, because sometimes it's not the most convenient time. Um, sometimes you're in the middle of something. Sometimes you're under a deadline. Sometimes it's not the employee you want to have that conversation with right now. And that none of that should matter. If an employee has got the courage to come forward and talk to you, you have to put your phone down. Step away from your email. Give them their, your attention. But you also, the fear of inaction, or you know, I, we talk about fear and futility, is is really strong as well. And so how do you close that loop back to the employee? When you can't tell them everything that happened, but how do you go back to that employee? So these are some of the skill sets that we're really trying to bring forward. But another one that, um, that I, I really tried to encourage in some of our senior leaders is every now and again, something will come across my desk and I'll think, wow, that employee was really, that took courage for that employee to come forward and we're dealing with it. I've asked the senior leader in that business line to just call that employee, just reach out and say, thank you for bringing that forward. What a powerful message for that employee to receive a call from a senior leader. Um, I had a case last year, an employee reported their direct manager, and she was new in the, bit, in the company, and I said, can you please have so-and-so call her or send her a note to thank her for that? Because that had to be really hard to do. And that's a really powerful message. So finding those little things that can, that, those little things are what change the culture. What's really difficult is that Many of the complaints aren't what we call pure complaints. And it's challenging. It's challenging. We'll have complaints that come forward on, you know, the next day after an employee has received a bad performance appraisal. We're still going to investigate it. We're still going to take it seriously. But again, we have to kind of sift through all the facts that help us understand, you know, is this a real concern? Is this somebody who is getting back at a manager? Is this somebody who's not happy because they didn't get the performance appraisal that they wanted? Is this somebody that wanted that promotion and didn't, didn't get it? And I'm not suggesting that we don't investigate. We investigate every single complaint that comes in. But I really like the approach, Katie, of you know, really turning this into a listening culture, too making sure that our managers and supervisors, we've implemented a, a new management trainee platform just for all kinds of reasons, this reason, or this one of the reasons. But don't necessarily discount the complaint that's coming forward just because it's that problem employee who's always complaining. Sometimes they have the best, best information. But it's really, really hard. Anybody that tells you that this is easy, um, hasn't been doing it for 25 years. Does somebody want to repeat her question? question was, there we go. If you have a whistleblower and it's someone that you, you need to protect their anonymity, and of course senior management, frequently their first reaction is, well, who would have said that? Who, who made that complaint, right? 
Um, well, the first thing I would do is send them the link to the articles today about the CEO of Barclays who was just fined a million dollars for trying to suss out the identity of, mm. of somebody mm -hmm. who was, was uh, whistleblowing. He also had his bonus ding, but he was fined by their regulators in, in Europe. Um, I, I, I had something, I, you know, I've had this happen in the past, but we just have to say, you know what, that's really not relevant. Um, we need to focus on, on the underlying issues and not worry about who might have raised the issue. Um, but it's hard to do because that's sort of human nature. Um, so I think some of the, you know, the things that Mina described of following up with that person over time to find out how they're feeling. Um, but I don't know, do you guys have thoughts? You know, again, this is probably one of the hardest things that we do because we do have senior management who many times will say, um, how I want to be involved and I want to help lead that investigation, and I need you to update me. How many times do we hear that? I would like a weekly update on what's going on, and especially, Peggy, if it's, a, as you know, if it's an FCPA or some other type of investigation that has broader implications, we really can't be updating everyone every week. Um, and so, once again, we be our objective, and we talk about what is our bottom line. We'd like to determine if, indeed, there is a legitimate concern that we need to address. We will call you when we need your help and if we need your help. And you have to respect the process. It's not only for the good of you, but it's also for the good of the company. Those are hard conversations, but we have those conversations all the time. And again, sometimes I'm not the most popular person at Ecolab, but I'm okay with that. And a lot of how you approach that as you get to know the relationships and the roles is who knows what when. I think I spend about a fourth of my time thinking about who knows what when at exactly what time and in what order. I'm never going to hide something, but there are also times I'll go to the GC instead of the, you know, it depends on the order, GEC, CEO, CAO at our shop. Um, depending on relationships, because you don't want to set them up for a retaliation claim either. But it, those are very, very hard conversations, a little bit related. I really struggle. So in some cases, you get a hotline that they want to remain anonymous. And um, you almost can't invest, you can't investigate without outing them. Those are really difficult conversations, because I have to tell them I am going to do the best I can, but I can't unhear you. Um, I can't unhear the allegation you just made. I think those are some of the hardest conversations. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, one that pains me are investigations that aren't anonymous, but investigations where we uncover something and we start doing an investigation. And we call it at our shop SBARs or IRACs, you know, the memo with the situation, the background, the analysis, the recommendation. That starts getting circulated and it's just, it's just an investigation. There have been no conclusions. I am really troubled with how far those go to whom and how far up until there's a conclusion because you can also never undo the damage that does to someone even if they're wholly exonerated. So kind of related. Can I just speak because you're working at larger corporations. If when you're in a, a, small, a small firm and, and, and in the financial services industry, there are many of those. There could be two men and a dog and, and you. <laughs> it does sound awesome. But the, you might not, there, there might not be anybody to go, you know, to, you know, file a complaint with. There, there's no whistleblower policy. There's, you know, there's no corporate office. So what do you do? And um, this, has ha this has happened to me where I have been in a situation where I felt that I couldn't be heard, I was excluded, I was blamed for things as a CCO. And th at that point, and there was no one that I, you know, I'm, I can go to the CEO and the C CIO, but they, they were partners and it was coming from them. So what do you do? So I had to you know, approach my husband and say, I need to leave my job because it's only a matter of time where I'm going to be on the hook, especially in a regulatory environment for you know, possible violations of things that I'm very much unaware of because that was also an issue. So I think this, you know, you have to look at what, what's at your disposal in terms of, you know, 
being able to express what's going on. If you don't have those resources and you are in a difficult situation, then that's the time that you need to say, there's the red flag that's gone up. It might be time for me to move on. So I just bring that up because we're talking about larger firms and they have these resources and I wish that I had had those uh, to my avail before, but um, I don't know what, what people are working in, but if you're in that situation, that would be my advice. I think the best advice someone gave me as I came into the role was, Remember, you're dealing with people's lives, right? So someone who's either reporting or who's a target of an investigation. And think about that when you're thinking about, you know, how you talk about it, what you share, right? And, and, and use data. I mean, we're, you know, many of us, I mean, I, I live by data as well, but it was kind of that, you know, also kind of think, think about with intention how you do it. We have a lot of senior executives that will call and, and, and say, you know, I want to know what's going on on this specific investigation. And there are times where I'll say at this point, I, there's nothing you need to know. We need to just let it continue. And there are times where I'll call a senior leader and say, FYI, we're going to be interviewing someone from your team. And you just need to know that. And that's about all you need to know at this time. And they don't like that. But that's okay, right? Again, back to the, you know, it's not a popularity contest. We're, we're here to protect the enterprise and to, to make sure we're doing things the right way. But it takes courage. So, so it's definitely one of the things that if you're not a courageous person, that will be diff more difficult for you. So can you give me a, a lesson you were asked in the beginning? What lessons would I also tell you? And this is one, surround yourself with good people, whether you're in a small shop or a large shop. Because honestly, when those questions come from senior leaders, tell me what's going on, tell me why, tell me how, I bring my people around in my compliance group and we talk about it and somehow or another, these bright minds that I work with help me be able to better speak to those senior leaders. So know who you can trust, know that they might not be that person that you, you think right away, you know, who can be your person, who can be on your team that you trust, that you can vent, that you can problem solve, that you can troubleshoot, doesn't even have to be in your own company. Sometimes it might be that outside counsel that you've been working with and you just want to pick up the phone and say, can you give me five minutes of some time? And um, it's so well worth it to surround yourself with good people. So what, that dovetails nicely into the next um, question, which is, but I'm gonna bring you back further back, like not where you are right now, and maybe not even the position you were in, you know, three years ago. But when you were first starting out, are there things that you were told or advice you were given, some lesson that you learned that you would like to share with this group here? You're, you you're all boiling lava hot right now, we, we aren't are. you? We're, and we're, <laughs> we're melting. We are, oh, we are I'm blinded. so sorry. No, I mean, I think, I think you've heard a lot of this. One of the things that I really want to emphasize is there are going to be times you're going to find yourself in an unhealthy environment, and you have to figure out, can I fix it, or do I need to leave? And that's hard to do, but you really have to be prepared to make those decisions. And... I think one of the most important things is going in is really be true to yourself and, and reflect on what are your non-negotiables? Like, what are your values that are just so core to you that if something isn't matching up with that, that you've got to find a different solution? And, and I, I found myself in a situation years ago where I was concerned, it was a, an organization I was with, that, that they weren't going to do the right thing on something. And I did. I sat down with my husband and I said, if this happens, I can't stay there. And we had our plan, we, and, and that was terrifying because I'm the primary breadwinner, now I'm the sole breadwinner, and that's terrifying. But um, to know that that was non-negotiable for me. And so, but we had a plan. We, we sat, I remember sitting on our porch for an hour and a half talking through what will we do if that's what happens. And fortunately it didn't. Um, that organization came through, they did the right thing, and, and, and it worked out. But you know, we were really, we were prepared that I might have to leave that place. And that was, you know, that was really scary. But, you know, by knowing what your non-negotiables are, you can really stick with your values and, and know that you're going to, you are going to, at some point, you may face that situation and have to decide. Um, 
And that also means, though, going into a new place, think about what is important to you, what about the culture, and how can you, how can you get information to help you determine, is this a place I want to be? Um, so, you know, what are those qualities that you're really, truly looking for, and how can you gather that information, talking to people who work there or people who used to work there, um, but knowing what it is that's important to you and how you can, how you can ferret out that information. I think one of the things I would, I would also think about is um, what is, you know, we, we never, if you're, if you're a student and you're going to join a company or a firm and, or if you're mid-level in your career, I think you have to think about, you know, it's not going to be ideal when you start. And I think sometimes, you know, like I have a 10-year-old daughter, right? So I'm like, go rule the world, do whatever it takes, you know. But, but I'm very pragmatic. Some of the things I hear today are the things I heard 15, 18 years ago, right? So things are not changing at the rate that I would like. So, so it's really about, doesn't mean you have to accept things that are toxic or things that don't align with your values, but you have to, you are going to be part of this. So the movement that started, whatever this, this continuous acceleration of civility, which I really like, you know, civility in the workplace, you're going to be part of it. Whether you're a new entrant to the workforce, whether you're a middle level, you, you have to kind of keep stepping into it because we have to do that together. 25 years in, I'm still stepping into it every day, right? With the hope that when my daughter goes to work, she won't have to have the same conversations or deal with the same things that I see happening today that I saw 15, 18, 18 years ago uh, when I started. But, but I think you have to, but then you have to find a culture where you're willing to make that investment. You know, one thing that I wish somebody would have told me, and sometimes it's still hard to believe, is that don't assume others are, are smarter than you, okay? Don't assume that. I mean, I walked into Ecolab, and oh my goodness, that legal department, I'm not kidding, they are probably 10 times smarter than, than me, or so <laughs> I thought. Um, you know, everyone has their place and their own strengths and can bring that to the table. So don't assume just because somebody has a great talk or understands biophysics or knows what fracking is all about or understands the energy services that you're not gonna be successful because you have a place and you belong if you're willing to put the work in, you surround yourself with good people and you keep your integrity at forefront. You really will. I'll say two quick things, my on. Two quick things. I wish, and this is a little different vein than, than the others, I would reiterate what all of you said too, but the um, world is changing, but if I could do it over now, what I would have studied 20, 25 years ago is I would kill right now for expertise in data analytics and statistics. Um, I would love to have that right now. Um, and it's, it's, I'm kind of teaching an old dog new tricks on this one right now. Um, and then secondly, and maybe more importantly, it wasn't until about five years ago that I started my People subscription, my People magazine subscription. I would do that way sooner. Because I finally realized I was making hair appointments and getting highlights just so it would take longer so I could read their People magazines. And it was way cheaper to just subscribe. The only thing that I've ever won was a contest that oh, it was about you know social, you know or social environment and all, and it was all based on the stories and people, and and I that was the only thing I've ever won in my life because I read People magazine mostly at when I'm getting my hair done, Highland, yeah. Um, the advice I, that I received early on, I had a great mentor, was always to listen, be a very good listener, you know. Um, take in as much as you can, and to always be a continuous learner, and, um, and never stay in the same job. And, and that was my parents. They both, one was a bond trader his whole life. My mother was an accountant their whole life. I sat down one day and I said, tell me what you would do differently. And they said, we would have done, you know, 50s, can get the kids kind of all set to go to you know, college. We would have done something different, taken our skill sets and done them someplace else because you want to keep your mind always going and having something um, you know, new and different to do. So that, those are probably the two things that I can add to. Well, the, I want to make another point is I think often our worst enemy can be the tape that plays in our own head. 
in terms of, oh, I need to check 500 boxes for a job that has 100 boxes. And, and I will tell you, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but you know, you know, as women we face challenges. I will also ask you to think about the intersection of women and race and ethnicity. There are other unique challenges that are presented there. And so I think that that's very important. Part of it is just don't listen to the tape that plays in your own head. At some point you've gotta go talk to someone that'll give you fresh perspective, right? Some different thinking, because that can, you can talk yourself out of why you should do anything. There's never been an Indian origin, you know, heritage vice president female at 3M. Well, then I can never do that, right? That, that's, it shouldn't, you know, so those kind of things, just as, that's one thing I would urge you is just mm -hmm. to break out of that earlier if you can. And I'll add my own experience. Uh, many of you know I was in-house at Land Lakes for 16 years, um, and then I went to uh, Syngenta Seeds, and I have my own experience with compliance and ethics, um, building those programs. And I think what, what I wish someone would have told me was to really be super, super thoughtful. I know that sounds really silly, like this is um, a group of thoughtful people, right? but be thoughtful in the moment and take pauses. And it's okay to not be talking just to talk. It's okay to really give yourself the luxury of silence. And then finding those people in your life that you can then talk about a situation or in, uh, you know, something that's happening that you're not liking so that you really think through how to, um, how to deal with it. Any other questions? Oh, well, Katie, I'm just going to tell ahead. you the best, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got. One of my uh, former colleagues from Human Resources at the bank, she was, I have to say, the wisest person I've ever met. And she retired a few years ago, and I miss her all the time. She said, your career isn't necessarily going to be linear. And in today's world, I think even more so, your career probably won't be linear. You're not going to just continually go up. Sometimes you have to go backward to go forward. And I, I just think those are words to live by, is to keep an open mind. Sometimes you go back, you take a step back to go forward, or you take a step to the side, and, and be, th be open to those options, because that can set you up for some really great things. I just wanted to add that um, I was speaking to a former board member, and she was telling me that women, if they, if they were posting a job, they posted a job description in a law firm, and they found that more men than women were applying for the particular associate's job. And so they decided to conduct their own survey and they found that the reason that women were not applying for this, this particular position, that they felt that they couldn't check off every box of the responsibilities. And so I, you know, I know I'm like that. I'm like, well, I, I don't have any experience with that. I don't have any experience with that. But I, and back, when thinking back on my own career, there, every position I was in, there were there was new opportunities for me to learn. So you know, you don't want to preclude yourself from those opportunities just by like read, reading a job posting and saying, you know, I, I don't, I can't meet every one of the credentials. If you can meet two, that's enough. There's been research. There's been research on this that if a job has five requirements, a woman will wait until she has all five, and then maybe apply, and a guy will apply when he has one. <laughs> There's been a lot of research. Google found this. They found this is my old DNI world, right? They found that women were not applying for these internal postings, and and they couldn't figure out why. They were very qualified, and what they found was that they would go. So they started they started going to women and encouraging them to apply, and that was kind of all it took to start getting some of that parity up. But it was it's a it, you know it's a fascinating you know thing that we see is that we tend sometimes hold ourselves back. Funny the person that I replaced who's one of my mentors said to me as I was walking into this job, fake it till you make it. And, you know, if you know this guy, he's pretty conservative and he's not going to want me faking it on lots. But I, I got the message. I got the message. Be confident, do the work, but you don't have to know every single thing. And it's okay to say, even to the audit committee, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. They're going to appreciate it a lot more than when you try to kind of bamboozle your way through something that really is nonsensical. Well, I think given the time, oh, go ahead. Another question. Hi, just one question. 
microphone works now, sorry. Um, as members of the executive leadership team, uh, there have to be times when there's probably not complete alignment about a compliance or an ethics issue. So my question to you is, um, is it your job to go on record that you don't agree and or so document? I feel like um, there might come a time where I think of it as going on record. I would have to say I've actually never gotten to that point in my career. I've, it's my job to very clearly present my opinion based on law and data. Depends. I mean, I, I have had situations where I have, I have, you know, documented my file of my position when I was overruled by someone who I didn't think was making the best choice, but that was their decision to make. Um, some of that's just pure self-preservation. Um, but I think it is important to stand up for what you think is the right thing to do, but to stand up with facts, data, and, and be able to explain it and help people make you know, an informed decision. And sometimes you know, it's knowing when to fall on your sword too. Any other questions from the audience? Jenna. Expectations are coming from another woman. Oh, that's a good question. Did everybody hear that? How do you handle situations where some of the issues, sexual harassment um, issues, are actually coming from another woman? I guess I'd handle it the same way as if a man or any gender was asking me to, to do something that I don't believe in. Um, I would be true to myself. And I, I'm fortunate, well in my career I have had actually women who have had expectations of how I should dress, what I should wear. Um, and thank you for that opinion. Thank you for your input. Yep. Duly noted. Yeah. <laughs> you work for too, people tend to move out of places that are, you know, that feel that, that in that kind of environment. And I often tell leaders, you know, you have a war for talent, not just externally, internally. So when you think about the way you, you interact with people, if nobody wants to come work for you, you're not going to be in your job for very long, right? So you have to think about how, what kind of environment you're creating. And I would say too that um, in that situation, if it were me having to deal with, and I have had this happen before where I had to deal with sort of a, um, a woman who was really difficult in uh, one of the law departments that I worked at. And I, I really got input from my colleagues that also knew what the whole office dynamic was. Because every office dynamic is different and so how you deal with that really depends on where you're working and there's no one that gets that better than your coworkers. So if you can find one person to you know, talk with what are the best ways for me to handle this, um, you know, because you don't wanna go behind her back and complain about her to her supervisor as an example of, you know, that doesn't exactly create a um, good environment either, but just finding someone to talk through those issues with, I think is very, very helpful. Regardless of gender, I, one issue that I've really learned and I think has been valuable for credibility, and it's really hard, but I never complain or report or um, have an issue with someone with their superior unless I've absolutely very directly told them and those are difficult conversations. It's sometimes easier to tell on someone to tell their, but I will never surprise someone. And I tell them that. I say, hey, I'm, I'm going to submit a, a, what we call it, a 360, you know, a um, performance review on you. And I've got some critical feedback that I'm going to give your, your manager, but I'm going to make a quick appointment to talk with you first. Tough conversations, but I really want to manage that message. So I've increasingly learned, and no bones about it, the more power you have, the more input you get to have. So I, I realize that part of that is learning and part of that is, is 
having more power through your years. But I wish I would have sooner been more direct with people in one-on-one -on -one feedback using I statements. In this meeting, I felt uncomfortable when you said this because, you know, as simple as that is, I have really committed to always telling the person first. And I think it's helped me with relationships. Any other questions? Um, how do you navigate the boys club? Um, I mean, sometimes um, I've worked for certain uh, departments where maybe there's more um, men there than there are women and you know, maybe they go out to lunch and they have discussions and stuff like that and um, I guess you're not part of the conversation and sometimes things come up and you know, maybe someone who was there gets a project because you weren't there and things like that. intentional about getting one-on-one -on -one time with people like that so it may be that you're not part of the club that goes out to lunch so maybe you take one of the more influential people from that group and you say hey can, can I take you to lunch I'd love to get your input on X and sort of insert yourself um, and maybe reach out to them as, and, and even invite them in as more of a mentor and build your network kind of one-on-one -on -one. that can be really effective um, but to be really intentional about about doing that um, and eventually you may find your way in it's unfortunate that it goes on, but I, you know, I have found that to be pretty effective, and I have, you know, tried to be really intentional about certain people I want to make sure I stay in touch with, and so I set up regular touch points with them, you know, lunch every quarter or something like that. Yeah, I think, um, and our job in these roles is also to to bring awareness to the supervisors and leaders that these types of behaviors are seen as not being inclusive. Right, so, so again, back to it's not just compliance's job or HR's job, but you know, messaging directly to supervisors, here's what behaviors look like you know, that are not inclusive. And so if, if in this company we keep telling people you know, we want the best and the brightest back to that, and you're, you know, you're eliminating part of the team from providing input, you're really not living that out. And I think part of it, people will say, well, I didn't re think about it that way, you know, well, yes or no, whether that's tr accurate or not, I think we also have to keep putting that in front of, in front of supervisors too. Yeah, I'm just gonna repeat again, I love the idea about calling it what it is, <laughs> naming body parts, and really calling it out, you know, being very forthright about what it is. And it is, it is not an inclusive environment. So one of the, um, first things I worked on when I was at Land Lakes, I was telling these ladies during lunch was a woman who had misrepresented her, her expense accounts. And when she met with me, she said, well, I'm not going to get fired for this, am I? She had put made up names on her expense account for companies and people that had attended an incentive event. And instead, she brought her aunts, uncles, cousins. I mean, she just wanted to take her family on vacation. Um, and when I called it out with her, she said, I'm not going to get fired for this, am I? And I said, well, you falsified expense reports. And her face just dropped. Like, when I used the word falsified, when I actually labeled it and actually said what it was that was, you know, the bad thing that she did, I think at that point she got it. Uh, up until that point, she did not know that she even did anything wrong. So I think really calling out and being, again, thoughtful about what you're saying and what you're um, trying to prevent is really important. Any other comments from the panelists? Oh, there's another question, I'm sorry. So in talking about ethics and compliance, they, I mean, they really seem to go hand in hand, uh, but they may also be viewed as two separate things that compliance may be easier to track or to implement under different rules and regulations, whereas ethics could be more difficult to monitor. So I'm wondering if you view ethics and compliance as separate entities, and how do you approach making sure that both are followed and viewed as important by every employee in the company? I'm 
Katie. I think there's a huge movement in yeah. compliance to link with ethics, and I think that's all good, and it is absolutely the base of everything, and in my experience that we've done in compliance is our values. That is the strongest base, way stronger than the law, Wait, right? Our ethics is way more, and our values are way more intuitive than the bullet points in HIPAA. Um, uh, that being said, it makes me a little bit nervous sometimes to say we're going to have this office with ethics on the door and own it. So for the same reason, I think, I think there's pros and cons. Compliance has benefited by having a seat at the table called compliance, and I think ethics could get that same benefit. The disadvantage is it makes it harder to say it's owned by all. So we were talking a little bit at lunch, and I think Mayo and maybe healthcare is a little bit of an anomaly here. There's a ton of bioethics, professional ethics in healthcare that, for instance, um, I would never go and ask to be retitled the ethics and compliance officer. That would be a bad strategy um, in a healthcare organization. Now, I think that's a little different in some other industries. We talk about, we have literally thousands of people doing compliance and risk management in our organization, and my little team of 12. Um, is focused on ethics, but we talk about it being everyone's job. And it was one of the, the, the key things when we set up my office a little over a year ago was that it doesn't mean it's Katie's job to make us ethical. It's, it's Katie's job and Katie's team's job to, to integrate it and help bring it out and, and help everyone understand that it's their job. But when you talk about marrying up ethics and compliance, the way we talk about it is, um, my guys are going to roll their eyes because they've heard this a million times. So. We talk about how you know there's you can have a really rules-based culture and really focus on compliance with the rules. And, and there's all kinds of research that says that people just naturally gravitate to the loophole. If you give them a million rules, you end up at United Airlines dragging a passenger off their plane. And they actually realized this. They they wrote an email to their customer to their passengers and said, "We realized that it came that, that this happened because we put compliance with the rules." compliance with our procedures ahead of doing what was right. And so I have these visuals I use when I talk to groups, and I talk about the rules being all the rocks in a jar. So we have a jar full of rocks. And no matter how many rocks you cram in there, there's still space between them. And that's where you have to supplement with your values, and you have to find that balance, because the values provide that context for people, because you can't anticipate everything. You're never going to have a rule or a law or a regulation that covers everything you do. And so if you've got a really strong set of core values that you are managing to and that people really embrace and, and want to adhere to, they're going to make better decisions when they face those situations. Um, and and in, there's you know it, it plays out in real life every day. I mean, my nine-year-old got in trouble last year at school because he he wanted to do something on a project. And I said, James, why do you think that was OK? And his response was, well, she didn't say I couldn't. And that's what happens. When you have a whole bunch of rules, if there's not a rule on point, people think that it must be OK. And that's where having a, you know, values to give you a context and a framework to make good decisions help supplement that. And that's how, we t how I talk about ethics and compliance being complementary. I would agree that they're complementary. And I think you know, our values are much hold us to a much higher standard than probably laws, depending on which country that you're operating in, right? So, so when we tell people, yeah, you might work for 3M in Indonesia, but when you come here, the expectation is this, and that expectation should be similar regardless of which country you're in, in terms of how to conduct, you know, business activities or your daily activities. And I think that that's actually easier for people to understand. Um, now we educate on certain laws like FCP, you know, there are certain things we do, but we talk a lot about, because there's legal risk and there's reputational risk, right? So there's lots of different ways that if people don't follow that value framework, that things can go bad. So I think values is a way to talk about it, and they are complementary. No, I agree. When I talk around the world about what our best asset other, of course, than our people at Ecolab, it really is our reputation. And at the end of the day, that's where it comes down to the values and to the ethics. Once you lose that reputation, whether or not you, you know, followed the black letter law, as we used to say in law school, but you didn't do it the right way or something that smelled a little not off, that's your reputation. And it doesn't matter how well you followed that law if your reputation goes down the tubes. You just, it takes you so much to earn that back. Well, I want to be conscious of the time, unless somebody, did any of the other panelists want to? Okay. It's, it's 3 o'clock, and I know that everybody has uh, very busy days, including the panelists, who have 315 meetings. 
Um, thank you so much for attending, and let us give our panelists a large welcome or a large <laughs> applause for thank you. Thank you so, so much, and enjoy the rest of your day.